Well, hello, North Island Assembly of God. Is everybody okay today? I'm a little discombobulated, but other than that, I am so glad. I've been looking forward all week to seeing you. I always do this. You are an amazing, amazing congregation. You know, I think one of the reasons I'm so excited is because this is the first opportunity I've had to preach since the 50th celebration. And so, uh, just how amazing that was. One of the things that, I don't know, shocked me and um, it was just hilarious to me, looking at the slideshow, I'm not sure who put it all together, but 50 years of ministry, I can't believe all the change that took place. My family has changed, our church has changed, the ministry has changed. Well, Sue hasn't changed, she's the only thing. She's the constant. She looks like the day I married her. Except it takes her longer to get to looking that way. But otherwise, she... Uh, you know, and I think when you look at old pictures like that, the thing is, you don't realize how much change has taken place because when you're with someone all the time, that change is so gradual, it's so slow, you grow slowly, you fade slowly, you gain weight slowly... <laughs> You lose it even slower. Your hair, your, your hair, what doesn't turn gray or white turns loose. I mean, everything seems to change. Sometimes I feel like an old car. You know, uh, how a car gets out of alignment and the paint starts to fade and the tires start to wear out. The brake pads start, start, start disintegrating. And, and I guess what I'm saying is, I'm a Model T. You know what I'm saying? Just an old Model T. And uh, I get that. But I'm going to tell you what has not changed. I'm as excited about Jesus. I'm as excited about preaching God's Word as the first time I preached. The very first sermon. Boy, those first sermons. My goodness. I look back. I've kept all my sermons. I've got thousands of them. Sue so goes, what are we going to do with all of these? Thousands of sermons are in my basement. And some of them, burn them. I thought she was going to publish a book or something. She's going to burn them. Eh? Fodder for the fire. But uh, I almost want to apologize. Some of those early sermons, were, they were something. But uh, fortunately, I've grown. Now, what I do have to admit, now that I'm turning, what am I turning, 72? 73? Whatever, I can't count. Two. 72 is that when I was young, I mean, even when I was in my 40s, my 50s, I was this inexhaustible supply of energy. I could, I could preach four times a week, do a wedding, do a funeral, go to a, a district meeting. At the same time, I'm working on my master's degree and building in a $4 million building program. It's just like I didn't even need to sleep much. But now... Sometimes I feel like one of those Sue, one of those helium balloons you get for our birthday. You know, it's really good for about three days, and after about the fourth day, you know how they just kind of start drooping a little bit? They don't hit the ground. They're still off the ground, but they're not on the ceiling either. And sometimes that's kind of the way that, uh, that I feel. But what I do understand is I can't do everything I did when I was beginning in ministry. You know what the Bible says, uh, the man's got to know his limitations. And, uh, well, actually, that wasn't the Bible. That was Clint Eastwood in a movie. But it's still true. It's a biblical truth. You, you, you learn to pace yourself. And what's obvious, you don't have to be a prophet to understand that Susan and I, after 50 years of ministry and 49 years of marriage, uh, we're on the home stretch. It's obvious. We're in the fourth quarter of our ministry, maybe the last few minutes of the fourth quarter, which is not a bad thing if you're an Alabama fan, right? I mean, they win a lot of games in the fourth quarter at the last minute. And I can still remember my high school coach saying, play through the whistle. Play. I, I was a tight end. I love to catch the ball, but when I catch the ball, that's all I want to do. And he would get in my face and say, you know, run with the ball. Don't stop just because you caught it. Run through the whistle. And so in my ministry, that's kind of what we're trying to do. Now, after four, 50 years of ministry, there are four words that really have been ignited in my heart, really, for months. These are the four words. After coming up to 50 years of ministry, the first word is celebrate. Lord, you have blessed me. Do you know that I, two weeks ago, I was ill 
um, and I couldn't be in the pulpit, and I was reminded that's only happened in 50 years. Sue, how many times has that happened? Maybe two or three times that I've been ill and not be in the pulpit. Now, there have been some times I was ill and went ahead and came into the pulpit, but I have, God has blessed me for 50 years with, with, with good health, and I am totally, totally celebrating that. And the celebration that you all did for me, I'm telling you, Susan and I were so overwhelmed. We had two district superintendents present, and both of them said to me, We've never, not only have we never seen it, we've never heard of anybody that was so celebrated by a local congregation as you are. And I just thank you. Sue and I spent two days, literally every night, we would go through and, and look at your cards and from, from the children to the senior adults. We just would cry. I mean, I said, I can't cry anymore. Let me take a break here. You all were so kind, so sweet to help us celebrate 50 years. The second word that came to mind was the word evaluate. After 50 years, you go, okay, where are we? Uh, where are we headed? It's kind of like if you're, when I went to the Mall of America, this huge mall, I was constantly looking for one of those maps because this place is so enormous, like you are here now. Here's where you are. Well, after 50 years, you try to evaluate. And then we do what I'm going to talk about in just a few moments. Then we recalculate. Okay, where are we going now? And then we anticipate, God, what do you have for us in the future and what do you have for North Highland Church? When, when I was 69, this is funny, when I was 69, uh, I came up with a 25-year ministry plan. I'm 69 years old, I came up with 25 years. And Sue said, when she heard that, she goes, you never have been very good at math. Uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, it, it's reasonable to assume statistically the probability of me being ministering at 94 is not real high, but I said uh, my bucket list is always going to be out there. I'm always going to be pushing forward. Uh, I don't know where the finish line is, but uh, I know I'm closer than I've been before, but I'm going to run through the tape. I'm going to keep running. I'm, the word retirement has never been a popular word for me because I've always said I'll never retire. I'm always going to be involved encouraging ministers. I'm always going to be involved helping churches. I always want to be involved in missions, doing what God has uh, called me to do and Susan to do. And I don't want to be morbid, but I want to be, I want to be very transparent. And I want to ask you something that I have asked myself a lot in recent years. And that is it. As I realize, again, I don't want to be morbid, but you know, in the runway of your life every day, that runway gets shorter. That's where David said, teach me, O Lord, to number my days. So not to be morbid, just to know every day you're alive, uh, for some of us, we got more days behind us than ahead of us. But here's the question I've been asking myself. What am I going to leave behind when I leave this world behind. What am I going to leave behind? Now, now, normally we think of possessions. We immediately start thinking about the stuff we have. How we're going to divide it up. How are our kids going to fight over the valuable stuff? How are our kids going to put all of the junk in our basement and our garage in the dumpster and say, this is garbage. Why didn't they throw this away years ago? What am I going to leave behind? Now, there are two things that are more important than the stuff we're going to leave behind. Two things. Number one, we're going to leave people behind. People we love. Our family. People we work with. People we go to school with. We're going to leave people behind. Here's the second thing that's so important. We're going to leave an influence behind. Influ that, that stuff we have is not going to last forever. It's going to fade. It's going to be lost but the influence is going to remain. I read, it kind of shocked me when I read uh, a few months ago, that wealthy families, 70% of wealthy families will lose their wealth by the second generation. It'll be gone. 90% lose it by the third generation. So what I want to talk to you about today, and I believe this is a word for some of you today, is something that's going to last forever. And that is, here's what I'm talking about, leaving a lasting 
legacy. Leaving a lasting legacy. I know that's a popular word. Most people talk about legacy around death. But I want to talk about legacy that, that David, this great king, gives us. It's a legacy while you're living. Yes, it's for dying, but it's a legacy also for living. Inheritance is what you leave to people. But legacy is what you leave in people. That's why I'm more interested. Uh, my kids, I'm not giving them anything. Uh, I want to leave some things inside of them. And this guy we're going to look at, I'm going to invite you to, to, to join me, and we're going to look at King David, who I'm telling you, this guy is so popular. There is more in the Bible about King David than there is... Uh, uh, well, Jesus is the only one that's more popular in the Bible than King David. So if you have your copy of God's Word, I'll invite you today to open it or click on your smartphone to 1 Chronicles. We're going to look in chapter 28 and chapter 29, a few verses in each one of those. David has spent 40 years leading the nation he loves. Now, I'm not bragging, but I, I got 50 years. I beat him 10 years. But he is no longer a young shepherd boy who killed the bear, who killed the lion, who slew Goliath. He's an old geezer. I'm talking about he's ready for Spring Harbor. He is there. He is he's an old guy. And these are really his last words recorded in the Bible. First Chronicles 28. We're going to read just a few verses. Stand with me as we read. And we'll just kind of use this verse as a launching pad for what I believe the Lord wants to put in our hearts about legacy. Verse 1, David summed all the officials of Israel to assemble at Jerusalem, the officers over the tribes, the commanders of the divisions in the service of the king, the commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds, and the officials in charge of all the property and the livestock belonging to the king and his sons. Notice he had multiple sons together with the palace officials, the warriors, and all the brave fighting men. In other words, all hands on deck. In other words, everybody. Everybody's included. Everybody who is anybody. All the who's who of the kingdom come together. I have something I want to share with you. Verse 2. King David rose to his feet and said, Listen to me, my fellow Israelites, my people. I had it in my heart to build a house as a place for a place of rest for the Ark of Covenant of the Lord, for the footstool of our Lord. And what he's talking about is just where God can be present. People can come and meet God there. And I made plans to build it, but God said to me, Nay, nay, you are not going to build a house for my name because you are a warrior and have shed blood. Yet the Lord, the God of Israel, chose me from my whole family. Now he's not bragging. Catch what he's doing. He chose me from my whole family to be king over Israel forever. He chose Judah out of all those tribes, those 12 tribes. He chose Judah as a leader. And from the tribe of Judah and my family and all my bratty brothers, uh, he chose me. And from my father's son, he was pleased to make me king over all of Israel. Now what he's trying to say, he's not bragging. He's not strutting his stuff. He's not strutting like a peacock. What he's doing is saying, I want you guys to understand, this has never been a job for me. This has been a calling. I didn't choose this. God chose me for this. How many of you understand you've been chosen by God? Yeah, it's not by accident you are where you are doing what you are doing. God has chosen you, and God's chosen you to leave a lasting legacy. Now, Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. You're my rock and you're my Redeemer, in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Now, David had one major dream, one major goal. He wanted to build the temple of God, and he's a bit disappointed he didn't get to do that. Now, I don't want to be discouraging. I want to encourage you that you're like David in that if you're a successful person, you're going to realize you are never going to achieve every one of your dreams, 
Every one of your goals, you're not going to climb every mountain you want to climb. That's just reality. If you do reach every goal, you didn't have enough goals. If you do achieve every dream, your dreams weren't big enough. God says He's going to do exceedingly, abundantly, above what we can dream, above what we can ask. I remember when we were trans, uh, transitioning from Atlanta here, there was a businessman in the community. He didn't actually go to our church, but he met with me and he looked across the table at lunch and said, I believe you're making a mistake. I said, well, that's interesting. Why, why would you say that? He said, because you still have some dreams and you still have some visions of what you want to see God do in this community, and all of those haven't come to fruition. I said, of course they haven't. I said, let me ask you something. Last year you left a business behind. Did you achieve every one of your goals? He goes, oh no, I, already had, I had more dreams and goals. And he started telling me about it. I said, that's the mark of a great leader. You don't just go, oh, I've arrived. Let's sit down. You always have more dreams. And the wonderful thing is, even though you don't reach every one of your dreams, you can create a scenario where you help other people fulfill their dreams. They build off your dreams. You lay a path for them to follow. Now, I'm going to do something very unorthodox. You haven't seen me do this very often. I'm going to preach a two-point sermon. Unless, I can probably think of a third point before I finish. But no, I'm going to try to stick to two points, and we're going to learn some life lessons. How do we leave... A lasting legacy. Here's the first point. Our legacy is going to be determined by where we lead other people. Where are we leading other people? Now, now David begins building his legacy, the foundation of that legacy, as you would expect. It's his own family. He looks at his own family and begins with his own children. He begins with his son, Solomon. He says to Solomon, I'm going to mentor you, I'm, I'm going to lead you to be the best and to be the most successful. You are going to be the successor in this kingdom. Now it's important that you understand, it wasn't just because Solomon was his son, because he had some other sons. But he chose Solomon because he was the most qualified. He chose Solomon because that's what God led him to do. And then he gives us his final words while he's on this planet. He has thought it through. He's carefully, prayerfully given these last words of advice. He's not ad-libbing. This is what he says to Solomon. This is good. Verse 9 of chapter 28. He says, And you, my son Solomon, acknowledge the God of your father and serve Him with whole hearted devotion and with a willing mind for the Lord searches every heart and understands every desire and every thought if you seek him he will be found by you but if you forsake him he will reject you forever now David does just what I would think he would do he begins with the heart he doesn't begin with the mind and say, Solomon, you've got to get your mind and positive. You've got to take care of your body. You've got to exercise. You've got to... He starts with the heart. After all, he's a man after God's own heart. And, and he helps Solomon understand usually the, the, the heart of the problem is the problem of the human heart. So he says, Solomon, you've got to get your heart right. What you need to do is seek God and serve God. Now let me do a quick roll call. How many parents are here? Just wave at. Oh wow, we got a bunch. How many grandparents? Okay, good, good. How many coaches? You coach some kind of a sporting team. Let me. How about teachers? How about managers? Or you leave someone somewhere? Listen. How many of you have a pet, and that pet looks to you for leadership? Okay, we are, we're all, listen, I want to encourage you today. We're all leading somebody. There are some eyes on you. There are some people looking at you. And let me tell you, if you could pull aside your children, your grandchildren, your employees, uh, your teammates, uh, your players on your team, anyone who's following you, if you could pull them aside and give them one piece of advice, wouldn't this be the best advice you could give them? Seek God and serve Him with all your heart. I mean, when you do that, everything else is going to fall in place. Don't you think, don't you think it's a good idea? Grandparents, parents, don't you think it's a good idea that we be as concerned about the influence we're going to leave as much as the inheritance we're going to leave? 
Listen, Solomon is being set up in a real good way. Uh, David is saying, I'm going to set you up to be a success. And that's the mark of a great leader. And the kingdom, I'm, I'm telling you, David has done a magnificent job. The nation is finally united under one flag, been divided for many years. I mean, the economy is booming. The capital city of Jerusalem is humming. It's the envy of all other nations around. The military is respected by all of their enemies. The songs that David has written are sung all over Israel. He's a popular guy. Most importantly, David is leaving a people who respect the king and who revere and reverence God. Now I know this week there's been a lot, an awful lot of of, uh, paying honor to the queen who is leaving a legacy. And I've heard that word so many times, how well respect, how, how that country, actually the countries of the world respected the queen. David is leaving a nation where people respected the king and they respected their God. And and what he's concerned about is not so much leaving them things of value, he is leaving them with godly values. If there's anything we've got to do, listen to me, parents, grandparents, we've got to leave godly values in our children. He is, and this is how he's leading them, he's leading them into godly values. David is just as concerned, not with uh, Solomon being powerful, but he wants him to be pure. Not to be great, but he wants him to be godly. Not rich, but righteous. Not famous, but faithful. Not haughty, but holy. He's not interested in how high he can get. He's interested in, in how low he can get before God in humility. Dwight L. Moody said this, made a famous statement one time, if you want to know the kind of parent you are, don't look at your kids, look at your grandkids. It's really true, isn't it? Because this life is much like a relay race. It's not a sprint, it's a marathon. And we take the baton and pass it to the next generation who passes it to their generation who passes it to their generation. Well, I, I recently read this, and I was so excited. I ran in and said, Sue, listen to this. And I interrupted what she was doing. A couple, the influence and legacy they had back in colonial days, I mean, back in years gone by in the 1700s, Jonathan and Sarah Edwards, pastor of a small church, wrote a lot of books, and was instrumental in what was called and still called the Great Awakening in America, the greatest revival that happened in America. He was a very much a catalyst in that. He and Sarah had 11 children, can you imagine? But he made a covenant with God. God, if, if there's anything that Sarah and I want to do, we want our kids to follow God and love God and serve God. Well, a guy in the 1800s, a guy named A.E. Winship that most of us wouldn't even know who that is. But he did a study of all of the descendants of Jonathan and Sarah Edwards and found out the ones that he could find, he found 1,400 and researched and listen to this. Just kind of take a deep breath. Listen to this. This is what Jonathan and Sarah Edwards produced. They produced their descendants 100 lawyers 80 holders of public office, 66 physicians and a dean of a medical school, 65 professors of colleges and universities, 30 judges, 13 college presidents, 3 mayors of large cities, 3 governors of states, 3 United States senators, 1 controller of the entire U.S. Treasury, and 1 vice president of the United States. Now, somebody may have said in those early days, Jonathan Edwards pastors a small church. He's written some books. What kind of a legacy? Can you imagine a better legacy than that? I mean, I remember as as my kids were young and growing up, I was like, Lord, just don't let them go to jail. Uh, You know, please please help them, Lord. But listen, what an incredible, incredible legacy they have. And you have a legacy. Legacy. And that's determined by where you're leading people. Let me tell you the, the final thing, and the last thing. A legacy is determined not only by where we lead people, but what we leave in people. 
Your legacy is determined by what you leave in people. David is not so much concerned about himself here, he's concerned about others. David's attention was on his successor, on his son. He was really concerned about having a smooth transition. In fact, that's the mark of a great leader, is that a leader will prepare a, a, a succession so that the kingdom keeps going forward. And David says, okay, Solomon, you've got to step up to the plate and be a godly leader. And he says to the people of Israel, you've got to step up to the plate and be godly followers. And he makes a huge decision. He makes a huge decision. David says, God, okay, you're not going to let me build the temple. I can't build it, but I can buy it. I may not be able to construct it, but I can pay for it. And David gives Solomon two things, amazingly. He gives him, number one, the plans for the building of the temple. And that's a, that's a huge thing. Because David could have said, hey, if I'm not going to be the king, you're on your own, dude. Yeah, I worked on these. I've worked years on these. This is my baby. And I'm going to take my ball and go home. I'm going to take my plans and go home. You're on your own. He didn't do that. He sat down with Solomon and said, I got all the plans. It's all ready. It's the kit. It's together. It's just got to be put together. And not only did he give him the plans, he gave him the money. He financed it. I mean, he, I'm sure Solomon would have said, oh, oh, these are great plans, but do you know how much this is going to cost? And David said, got you covered. I've already taken the money out of my savings and my 401k. We're, here are the blueprints and here's the money. What an example. What an incredible example. In 1 Chronicles 29, in the first five verses, it says David gave silver, he gave gold, he opened up his personal bank account, and from all of his treasures, he blessed the people and said, this is going to, to give you the money to build the temple. You're not... And, and you need to consecrate yourself today. But what happened was, people were so inspired by that, he created an avalanche of giving. People started giving all kinds of things so that the largest single offering in history that was taken was on that day. Now, I'm not getting ready to take an offering, so relax. And put your pocketbooks away. We've already done the offering. Because this is not so much about David raising money it's not so much about David going, oh, I'm going to give so I can get my name on a building. I want a plaque in the foyer honoring me for paying for this building. Uh, I want to be a legend. No. He had only one desire, and that was that the people have a love for God and that there be a temple where they can come and feel the presence of God. And isn't that what we want? Isn't that why we come together? Isn't that why we have a very commodious facility? And, and, and we try every way in the world to make it a place where you can come and feel the presence of God. So it wasn't so much for David about a building. It was about a blessing. It wasn't about a place. It was about a passion for God. In fact, somebody calculated, this is amazing, somebody calculated in modern day dollars the value that David gave. And silver, back in the Old Testament, and silver was $450 million. In gold, it was $17 billion. Now again, let me say, you'll miss the point if you think David's just trying to raise a building. No, he's leaving a legacy. And the amazing thing, when you get down to verse 6 through 9, the people rejoiced that they could give. They were inspired when they saw the leaders bringing the money to bless the house of God, to build the house of God. They weren't like, oh no, I, okay, I'm going to give begrudgingly. They didn't look like they were getting ready to have a gallbladder attack. They gave wholeheartedly. Now listen to this prayer. Now I'm going to be finished. Listen to this prayer in verse 10. One of the greatest prayers, other than Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, this is a great prayer. David's come full circle, verse 10. David praised the Lord in the presence of the whole assembly, saying, Praise be to you, Lord, the God of our father Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor. For everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. And he goes on in verse 12, wealth and honor come from you. You're the ruler of all things and your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. Now, our God, we give you thanks and praise your glorious name. Do you give what David is doing? He said, oh, you think I'm the king and that this is the throne? No, no. 
The throne is in heaven and the real king is the king of kings. To him be the glory. To him be the honor. Because he is everything. And furthermore, he owns everything. He is the sole proprietor, the single owner of everything. Look at what you have today. Your clothes, your house, your car, your computer, your TV, your real estate, your children, your new boat, your motorcycle, your 401k, whatever it is you have, bundle it all up, put a ribbon on it, and realize it's not yours. It belongs to Him. David, I, I conclude again, David wanted the people to do these two things. He wanted them to live for God's glory and he wanted them to give to God's work. That was his sole desire. And boy, this, Sue, this would be a great epitaph to put on my tombstone. Not anytime soon. Don't, you got way too excited when I said tombstone. Verse 28. David died at a, listen to this, David died at a good old age, having enjoyed long life wealth, and honor. His son, Solomon, succeeded him as king. Wow. Now here's the good news. If you're a young person, right now, right now is the time to start thinking, how am I going to lead people? What am I going to leave in people? In my friends, in my family, in my parents, in my grandparents. What am I going to leave? My fingerprints are going to look like what? on all of these different lives. If you're an older person, you may say, it's too late. I've already, you know, lit. No, it's never too late. You can rewrite your own legacy right now. You can, this can be a game changer today when you say, Lord, the most important thing in my life is how I'm leading others, where I'm pointing others, and am I leading them to love Jesus? That, that, that's the bottom line of it. And I, I just want to pray for you. Would you just bow your heads in prayer? And I'm going, to, I'm going to ask my family to come and join me on the platform right now. Lord, I pray right now, if there's anyone here that they've not made a commitment to you, that day, today will be the day that they do that. Today they'll make the decision. Today they'll make the day that they drive a stake in the ground and say, I'm, from this point on, I'm going to leave a lasting legacy. And it's going to be a godly legacy with godly values. If they've not confessed you, may they confess you as their Lord and Savior today. If they've not called on your name, that today they'll do that. They'll fill out a card. They'll drop it off in the back and know that we are praying for them and we're going to do everything to help them in this spiritual journey. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Hey, North Highland Church. My name is Bo Schramm. I just wanted to say thank you so much for watching this video today, and we wouldn't be able to do it without you. Now, what I want you to do is like, share, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can also visit our website for more information if you need it. Have a great day.